So my name is Alexander Justin. I'm an anesthesiologist originally from Brussels in Belgium. I worked in uh, Erasmus Hospital in Brussels for uh, my residency and then for my uh, junior faculty uh, position. And then I am now in Paris. I work in Paris in Paul Bruce Hospital, but also in Bisset Hospital here in the south of Paris. And uh, next month I'm going to move to uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. So I'm an anesthesiologist mostly. Uh, I uh, do, uh, like, let's say, um, high-risk abdominal surgery. Hi, I'm Sean Kuklenberg. I also trained at Erasm, and I'm also working at Paul Bruce Hospital. And I was actually trained by Alex. Okay. So right now I'm working quite a bit on uh, hemodynamic optimization, but also anesthetic depth and nociception monitoring during major abdominal surgery. Mm. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you guys. Yeah, so usually what I do is that I use it for all patients undergoing a high-risk surgery. It can be a vascular surgery, major vascular surgery. It can be major orthopedic surgery. But here, in my case, it's for major abdominal surgery. Whatever it's laparoscopic or open surgery, we use it usually for high-risk abdominal surgery. Uh, from induction to uh, or just post-induction, through the end of the surgery, sometimes during the recovery room, in the recovery room, but uh, usually uh, just during the intraoperative period. The main interest in using advanced hemodynamic monitoring is to be able to detect any alterations in cardiac output or perfusion pressure quickly. So having an arterial line is useful for the blood pressure part, but for the cardiac output, we need to have something that gives us an idea. So you could either use something that's uncalibrated like uh, the hemosphere values, or we could use a swan GANS catheter. Here at Paul Bruce, we do quite a bit of liver, liver transplantation. So the, the pulmonary catheter is useful, but for all the, the liver resections, we could use the hemisphere. And what we hope really to see is any alteration in cardiac output that could have an impact on post-operative outcomes, such as renal failure, or just simply fluid overload. It's really useful for us because we've got important hemodynamic shifts. And if we don't detect it quickly, we might have kidney injury. We might have patients that have pulmonary edema. We might end up having shock with increased lactate values and patients that can't be extubated as quickly as we would hope. Oh, clearly, if you keep a patient intubated longer, they'll probably stay longer in the intensive care unit. That's already cost. If a patient has kidney injury to the point of requiring dialysis, that has an impact not only on morbidity, but also on mortality. So, and if a patient has a pulmonary edema, that also requires more critical care and will thus make the patient suffer more, but also cost more to the society. Yeah, so AFM, in fact, it's, a, it's for assisted fluid management. In fact, it's just a real-time clinical decision support system that will recommend to the clinician when the patient may need a fluid challenge. Then the system is going to analyze the effect of the fluid challenge you gave to the patient and then continually reassess the patient for further fluid requirement. So it's a decision support tool to help ease the clinician apply goal-directed fluid therapy strategy during surgery. Yeah, you want to add something? Exactly, and it's, it's really important to underline that this software is based on two things that allow us to personalize fluid therapy. First of all, it has a baseline layer based on previous patient populations where as soon as the patient is monitored, it starts analyzing and compares that patient to thousands of previous patients to be able to give us an idea of when we have to give fluids. But then it goes even further. Then it asks us to administer a fluid and evaluates the fluid response and then corrects using an adaptive layer, the model layer. So you have this kind of personalization of care that is extremely difficult for a clinician to do, but since it uses specific equations, it's able to do it quite quickly and, and allow us to optimize microcirculation and macrocirculation of the patient. Yeah, so the main difference is that a closed loop system is going to administer the fluid directly, while the assisted fluid management is just a recommendation. It can be good because the clinician may always feel he has a interaction with the system and should approve or not the fluid bolus recommendation. Now, 
There's one point I want to add to this though. This software comes from a closed loop software and this closed loop has been shown consistently to outperform clinicians. It uh, optimizes uh, preload, it uh, reduces, or it's associated with, with a reduction of post-operative morbidity. And every time a clinician doesn't follow the recommendations of the AFM, it goes more towards manual care, which has been shown several times to be less performant or less good when compared to the software. So I would strongly recommend people to accept the boluses whenever they use it, with only a couple exceptions of uh, where, where perhaps the monitor is not functioning correctly. But if you're in a good situation where the monitor is working correctly, you don't have any artifacts, you shouldn't go along and give the bolus. So we in the operating room, you know, we have uh, to manage multiple tasks simultaneously. You have to, uh, to of course, uh, manage hemodynamic ventilation to prepare uh, the, the next case or even to supervise multiple operating rooms simultaneously. So we are not all the time 100% focused on fluid management. So having a tool that can ease, uh, uh, um, reach the goal we want to reach for the patient is still useful for the clinician. Actually, think of it like this. AFM is like having an extra set of eyes that's constantly looking at a few parameters and evaluating them as well and giving you a precise recommendation based on a detailed analysis of the patient's fluid status. It's something that we can do as clinicians. Everybody knows how to do it. But when we practice anesthesia and we take care of critical patients, we have so many other things on our plate that we can't just focus on that parameter. So it's really, it's really like having a tool that's constantly looking at an important parameter and that gives us the best possible suggestions that we have found so far today in perioperative medicine. Yeah, once again, uh, it's the same as a uh, goal-directed fluid therapy, which is applied manually for the moment all over the world or in many centers. It's mostly, it has been shown that this strategy can improve patient outcome undergoing, uh, let's say, high-risk surgery. For moderate or low-risk patient, evidence are less obvious. So we, at Paul Bruce, we use it for high-risk abdominal surgery, which means major liver resection surgery, pancreatic surgery, but when I was in Bicetre, we did it on a major urological procedure, cystectomy, esophagectomy, cancer debulking, etc. I think even in lower risk operations that, that last a very long time, it could be useful. You know, head and neck surgeries, where they reconstruct the face because they've removed a large tumor, um, surgeries that take more than eight hours. Some, some of these operations, the surgeon doesn't even want any vasopressors because they're scared of um, ischemia, of grafts. So if we, if we optimize fluids and we keep an, if we have a tool that's keeping an eye on fluid status constantly, I think theoretically at least, it should be able to help uh, administer better care. So I tested the, the system for the first time in 2017. So at Erasmus, we had some patient uh, who had a manually conducted goal-directed fluid therapy strategy. And then in March or something like this, or in June 2017, uh, we had the AFM system. So we did a small before-after study. And so we implemented for the next consecutive patient the AFM system. And what we have shown is that patient in the AFM period, so after the implementation of the AFM system in our patient, patient spend less time during surgery in preload dependence. So that was the first study. The second one was um, a double study. It was when we arrived here in Paris. Uh, we had a, let's say, a, gold, a hemodynamic protocol, and the goal was to maintain mean arterial pressure and stroke volume index within 10% of the optimal value. So I compared this strategy, manually conducted, to a double strategy, an AFM system for fluid administration, coupled with a closed loop system for vasopressor administration. And so the primary outcome was the incidence of postoperative hypertension, defined as a mean arterial pressure below 65. And we have shown that in patients 
under uh, with this double technology, EFM and closed loop system, they spend a significantly lower period during surgery with hypertension. And when we know that hypertension is linked to postoperative morbidity, this can be useful for uh, for the of course the clinician and for the patient. There is another study uh, conducted in the US. Did you know this study? Yeah, by, uh, in the Cleveland Clinic yeah. by Daniel Sesterstein. Yeah. So th that's a, a really nice study as well that uh, looked at uh, the outcome of either AFM or the clinician being able to predict uh, an increase in stroke volume index of 10%. And what they found was that AFM outperformed clinicians. And I, I would take a step back because we're talking about assisted fluid management, but remember this software comes from a closed loop system. So not only do we find this study from the Cleveland Clinic that shows that it outperforms clinicians, not only do you have Alex's study at Erasm that shows that you have patients that are less fluid responsive in the AFM group, but we also have these closed loop studies that were done over the past decade that consistently show better parameters of macro circulation, increased cardiac output, less uh, stroke volume variation above 13%. So we have better fluid status in patients that have care with these algorithms, which are actually the same. Just one is completely autonomous, the closed-up system, and the other one allows the clinician to accept or not the bolus, which is assisted fluid management. And then we have we have other studies, right, Alex? Yeah, that you will do for your PhD yeah. on the assisted field. Can you detail a little this one? Sure. So we've done two studies. One is under review and hopefully will be published very soon. It's the micro support study. Yeah. So there we use assisted fluid management during high risk surgery. So we looked at um, assisted fluid management versus goal directed fluid therapy. So both groups had a hemisphere. Both groups had a a protocol that was supposed to optimize preload. And our primary outcome was the MFI, the microcirculatory flow index, which is a parameter of microcirculation. It's been, it's been studied, for example, during uh, hemorrhagic shock and trauma patients, and there's a correlation with, with bad outcome when the MFI is low. And an MFI below 2.6 is considered to be suboptimal. So we looked at this parameter, among others, such as cardiac output, stroke volume, mean arterial pressure. Preload dependence also. Preload dependence. And we, we found some really nice, nice results. So first of all, for preload dependence, there was 23% of case time of preload dependence in the goal-directed group, and only 3% in the AFM group. So it's like seven times less. And if you have a, an operation of... Um, of four hours, it's almost like having uh, one hour of preload dependence if you do it goal directed, or less than 10 minutes of fluid responsiveness if you use AFM, which is, I mean, it's a huge difference. It's almost, it's almost an hour difference between both groups. Then we looked at cardiac output, which was, which was higher. Mean arterial pressure was the same, but there were a lot more vasopressors that were administered to maintain this mean arterial pressure in the goal-directed group. And when we look at microcirculation, we see that in the AFM group, microcirculation, as shown by the MFI, is almost maximal. So I think it's 2.88. And the maximum, of course, is 3. While the values are all right in the goal-directed group, I think it's a mean of around 2.6. But more than 50% of patients have values below 2.6, which again is a, considered a threshold for, for suboptimal microcirculation. So what we showed in the study is that if you use AFM versus a goal-directed strategy, where we try manually to avoid fluid responsiveness, we end up having better flow, both in the form of cardiac output, as well as in the microcirculation. There was also lactate, that was lower in the AFM group, showing that there was less tissue uh, hypoperfusion. So very nice results. And then we have another study, and this is kind of a controversial study, isn't it, Alex? That's coming yeah, out. and the study just yeah. finished a month ago. So, yeah. so we're, still, the result, yeah. we're still analyzing yeah. the data. 
but it's uh, it's pretty exciting, and I think you need to, to keep an eye out for it because we're comparing assisted fluid management to uh, usual care during liver resection. And as you, you know, during major liver resection, we're supposed to give as little fluid as possible during the, uh, the liver resection because there's this risk of increased central venous pressure, and increased blood venous ble bleeding, and uh, surgeons, you know, they're real reticent to administration of fluids. So it's kind of a controversial study, and we're looking to see if there's a difference in lactate in this study. And we'll see, and we'll, we'll let you know very soon. The first one was, uh, of course, less hypertension. Of course, it was a small monobicentric study, so we did not have the power to uh, assess patient outcome like a heart outcome, like renal acute kidney injury or uh, myocardiac infarction or even co infectious com complications. But uh, we have shown that there is less intraoperative hypertension, and we know that there is an association between intraoperative hypertension and patient outcome. And which is a kind of surrogate, of course, outcome. We have shown that there is less also uh, lactate level, so a lower lactate level at the end of the surgery, which can be good also because at the end of a surgery, when you sometimes hesitate if the patient needs to be on the floor or in the ICU or in the PACU, if the lactate is lower, probably it can help you discharge the patient to, the, to his room. So. Yeah, so we have less hypotension, less fluid responsiveness. Yeah, less preload dependence. Lower lactate. So th those are nice initial outcomes, intraoperative outcomes, but they're not hard outcomes yeah. like uh, kidney disease. Mm. So what we're going to do mm. is we're going to do a multi-center study, right? Yeah. yeah, very soon we'll start a, a large, uh, let's, uh, we call it a um, step wedge cluster randomized control trial. So each center is going to start with a period of standard of care and then move to the implementation period of the AFM at a different moment, okay? And so uh, the target is 2,000 patients and the primary outcome will be a composite of major postoperative complications, including myocardiac injury, acute kidney injury, infectious complication, etc. So uh, we'll start the study around mid-September and we expect to finish in the next two years. I think for the, the patients and for clinicians, it's going to allow us to give a better quality of care, yeah. to maintain, maintain the patient's physiology, to avoid states of uh, hypotension and uh, preload dependence, and ultimately to allow patients to wake up better, healthier, and go home happier. The first thing is you have to decide as a clinician which strategy you want. So you can choose between 10%, 15% and 20%. What does it mean? If you choose 10%, it means for the clinician, it's not if the stroke volume variation is above 10%, it's going to recommend. That's easier, too easy. 10% means the strategy, the free strategy of 10% means that the system is going to recommend you a bolus because the system believes that after your fluid administration bolus, after your fluid challenge, patient stroke volume is going to increase by more than 10%. And therefore, it's a more liberal fluid strategy compared to a 20% fluid strategy. It means that it will recommend if the system believes that the patient after your bolus is going to increase by 20% its, it's, uh, its stroke volume. So first, you have to choose the strategy. Of course, it can vary during the surgery from a more liberal at some point to a more restrictive fluid strategy. For example, during the liver resection, we can be a little more restrictive while when the liver is uh, completed, the, the resection is completed, then we can be a little more liberal. Then, of course, if there is no fluid recommendation, but as clinician, you believe the patient may receive a fluid challenge, you can do a user bolus. So you can still overwrite the decision or not really overwrite, but you can auto suggest a fluid bolus. And the system is going in the same way to analyze the effect of your bolus and then keep it in his mind to uh, recommend future bolus. And of course, what is nice, it's the more the bolus the system recommends and are followed by an action, the more the system is going to learn how the patient responds and the more the system is becoming more precise. It means that if you use an AFM for a very low risk patient and the system is just going to recommend one or two bolus, I don't think it's going to be better than human being. But when the surgery is long, the patient needs a lot of fluid. Therefore, the system can be well better than the human being. 
So yeah, for the moment, uh, there is a recommendation. What we should do is, of course, to titrate the amount we want. It can be 100, 250, 500, but you have to give the amount of fluid. With the fluid meter, it will be done automatically or almost automatically. But for the moment, there is just a monitor. Then we have the AFM when there is a recommendation that we have to follow by an action. The action, we have to do it. And therefore, the next step could be to have a fluid meter. So you just have to click on or accept the bolus and the system, the, uh, the bolus is going to be delivered to the patient automatically. And of course, the next step is to have a fully automated system without recommendation. What do you think, Chen? I think it's a great next step because remember, one of the big problems with goal-directed therapy is compliance. A lot of people want to do goal-directed therapy, but then do it maybe 60% of the time, 70% of the time. And actually with uh, AFM, we could have a certain limitation, which is how much fluid we actually administer during the bolus. So as you know, when you use AFM, you say, okay, I'm gonna give the bolus, and then you give a certain quantity. And some people will just kind of look at how much they give and estimate the amount. And then they write that amount into the software. And this could vary for, for every single bolus they give. Well, if you use this tool, you're gonna end up having quantitatively the exact same amount, you will know how much it is, and it will allow a reproducible and precise information to be transmitted to the software, which is gonna quite probably work even better than if you tell it you're not giving exactly what you're giving. So it allows us to be even more precise. And also the other point, in addition to this additional precision, is the fact that it facilitates our work. Instead of having to open our IV line and look at the fluid bag or take a syringe and administer ourselves the, the 250 cc's with a 50 cc syringe, which takes a little bit of time, we'll have a tool that does it almost automatically. All we're going to have to do is press on the button. So I, I think it's, it's really a great step forward towards automation of goal-directed fluid therapy to improve our patient care.